Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Scott Turow, and we're going to be speaking about his new book, The Last Trial. You know, I'm very excited about this book. I was up till 2 a.m. reading it the other night, so 2 a.m. again, Bless you. which is really, really lovely. And I'm going to hear more about why I was doing that in a moment. But I did a quick look on my shelves at the house, and I am so happy to see that I have Tarot titles here. I've got Presumed Innocent, which I actually read before I started this company 24 years ago. I mm. read it when it first came out. And then we have Innocent, and we have Testimony. So there's a common theme going here of red and black covers. And I'm going to confess that usually I try to match the book and I gave my red shirt away the other day. So <laughs> I was going through the closet today. Where's the red shirt? And I was like, oh, I said, I'll never wear red. So I'll give the shirt away. So yeah, well, there I'm you go. wearing white to match the lettering. So there you go. See, there's a reason to this. So Scott, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for, thank you for sharing some time with me. I really appreciate it, Carol. This will be really fun. I'm still looking forward to it. So how did it feel stepping back into the shoes of Sandy Stern, who had appeared in every one of your books, here getting a starring role at the center of the stage of the end of his career, decades after you first introduced him? Yeah, well, I mean, this is, Sandy, as you correctly point out, has uh, been in every book, um, but I, I, only in the burden of proof 30 years ago did I write from his point of view. So, uh, you know, this was like meeting an old friend, but uh, an old friend who's 30 years older. And we all know from our experience in life um, that generally as people age, they become themselves only more so. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, Stern, um, Stern certainly is, you know, the first citizen of my fictional universe. Uh, and I didn't find it hard to um, echo his sensibility as I'd created it once. Um, what required imagination though, of course, is, you know, what's happened to this man in the last 30 years. And in particular, since he's 85 years old, uh, and um, taking the bold step of trying, you know, one more important criminal case. Um, you know, how is he going to respond physically and emotionally to that challenge? Uh, and what, if anything, uh, is it going to add to his appraisal of his own life? Uh, and so th those were the, the big things that seemed to be swimming at me as when I started this book. I tried for a while um, to write in the first person. Uh, and I found that I didn't think Stern um, was somebody who would be fully frank about his own reflections about things. He would be he would be too diplomatic to be as interesting as I think he really is. So I reverted to the third person, and uh, then the book really started to work. You know, I could see that because there's so much of you just observing him, his mannerisms or whatever, that he wouldn't be able to get across the same way if you were doing him first. It just right. wouldn't work right. because part of it is just sitting back and watching him and seeing how he's relating to different situations outside of himself. And yeah. you're you know, able to see how he's moving around the room. He only had a leading role in one other book. Is there a reason that like, he never got another story role? Well, I, you know, I'm, when I started out, um, you know, Presumed Innocent, of course, was successful truly beyond my wildest dreams. And, uh, you know, people wanted me to write another Rusty Savage novel. And... I wasn't interested in writing a traditional series. You know, by now, this is 12 novels, all of them set in whole or in part in Kendall County, this imaginary Midwestern city. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't know that was where I was headed as a novelist. Uh, I'd had this incredible success and I kind of wanted to spread my wings and see what I was inclined to do. So, um, you know, that, that of course is 
is is what I did. Um, and you know, there are a lot of interesting people in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, it, I'm I it, I'm not sure it actually struck me before, but I'm working on a new book now. And the main character is not a lawyer. And I guess that's the first time I've done that. So, um, but, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I've sort of felt my way along in terms of what my own interests are emotionally. And um, the, uh, and I, you know, I was ready to come back to Sandy when I was ready to come back to Sandy. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think about it for a long time. One of those things you sat there and did a lot of overthinking. And it's really interesting because I was thinking about, did you ever think you'd write another book in Kendall County when you first started? And here you go. There's been this whole career. Yeah. It's, it's some things that just weren't planned. Well, what happened, you know, was uh, as fairly obvious, which is, uh, you know, I wrote Presumed Innocent, Stern, um, comes to life in the middle of the book. Uh, he basically runs away with the show. Uh, and uh, that was the first time I had that experience. Uh, and I was, you know, so taken with him that, uh, you know, I wanted to write about him more. So I wrote The Burden of Proof, where, where he was at, at the center. And, um, you know, one, one thing led to another. Uh, and uh, in the burden of proof, there was Sonia Klonsky, who shows up now as the judge in the last trial. And she was the one I was taken with. So I wanted to write about her, which meant I was going to write another Kendall County book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got stuck on that book. So I wrote Pleading Guilty in between. Uh, and by then, I was at home in Kendall County. You know, I, I, I owned that place. So. Uh, and it was my pleasure to be there. Well, it's funny because I walked in the other night and I told my husband I was working on this. He goes, oh, Kendall County, Sandy Stern. And I looked at my husband and he said, yeah. He goes, I know exactly. I know all the books. And it was, be, I immediately saw a sense of place. And I like that. I said, I mean, it was really lovely. You know, right from the prologue, we see how fragile Sandy's health is. I mean, it's right there, right out there. What prompted you to do that open? Because it's, you know, it's that cold open of, okay, he ain't doing so well, folks. Yeah. Um, well, this was actually um, the inspiration of my editor, Ben Severe, at Grand Central. And I uh, had finished um, probably three drafts of the book at that point, maybe even four. And Ben said to me, you know, uh, there is that moment where Sandy collapses and um, it's really under dramatized because the book is from his, it's, it's close third person. You're seeing the world as he sees it. Well, when the guy blacks out, <laughs> you don't know what's happened. Hey, the black. That, you know, that's an incredibly dramatic moment. I think it's a great entry point into the story um, because there's an inherent suspense there that you don't take advantage of. And um, why don't you think about writing a prologue? Well, by then, um, you know, a lot of my friends had read the book and I said, why don't you think about this idea of a prologue and asked my agent. Um, and uh, nobody was really sure about it. And, uh, you know, and I, uh, you know, the, there was a nice, nice review in the New York Times yesterday, but probably the only negative word when, was when Janet Maslin referred to that as, a, as histrionic uh, at the beginning. And I teased Ben about it. I said, I told you the critics weren't going to like this. <laughs> um, but I, I, I said, OK, I'll try it. And I wrote, you know, the prologue pretty much as it stands in an hour, two hours. It just came out. And of course, then I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, God bless it. He's right. He's right. Sometimes these doggone editors know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, everybody who'd had their doubts uh, ended up agreeing that Ben had had a really inspired idea. 
Yeah, what I liked about it was the way everybody came together. Everyone had their role as he's passing out on the floor of what right. to do. And right. then you and find everybody's, out later. Everybody's in a different role. The prosecutor has been across the across the um, courtroom, you know, banging heads with Stern is now uh, lifting his unconscious body. Uh, the judge of all people is the first to give him mouth to mouth resuscitation. Uh, you know, his daughter, who's very good lawyer and his law partner 30 years she's just completely frozen frozen uh, and mortified and uh you know and, and his granddaughter pinky who's uh their paralegal and uh a, a um sort of uncooperative soul um uh, you know ends up taking over uh quite uncharacteristically uh and uh you know, I think the reader can probably sense by the end of the last trial that uh, that moment in the prologue is, is actually going to be a critical event in, in Pinky's life mm -hmm. uh, because uh, she's, uh, you know, sh she's reacted appropriately and saved somebody's life. Yeah, she has, there's strains of her that we're going to talk about that happened throughout the book that you're seeing. She changed a little bit. You know, Sandy loved being needed by his clients. Right. He loved that moment of speak to no one. I'm on my way. You know, right. I'm coming in like, you know, underdog to save the day. Right. And he's devoted decades to his career. And this great line is he's certain that without it, he never would have known himself. Right. And it was such a great line because he really felt like his career defined him and what he did with those people. Right. Um it is a strange role being a criminal defense lawyer. And obviously, having played that part myself, I thought a lot about it. And, uh, you know, and Stern shares many of my thoughts about it. Uh, you know, and you do say to yourself at moments, I wonder if I'm hanging around with criminals because I don't have the courage to be a criminal myself. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, and I want to know what it's like to walk on the other side. And I, you know, with 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 cops and prosecutors and defense lawyers, there is there is a strong element of that. Uh, and of course, it it's natural in all three of those professions that uh, sometimes people forget where the lines are. But um, and, and you know, Stern also observes another great aspect of practicing the criminal law is that. Uh, although it's never appreciated as such, criminality is one of humanity's great forms of creativity. You just can't believe people had the gall uh, <laughs> or the imagination uh, to do what they have done. So, uh, you know, there, there is a, there's a lot to it as a profession. You know, which brings us to, he's, you know, indicated, you know, the mantra that got him through the 60 years of an attorney was serve the law and justice ahead of the client. Right. And he's got this really interesting client this time. Do you think he's still able to see it in the eyes of, you know, who's asking him to save him this time? And let's talk a little bit about the character of Kirill because his nature is totally putting him on edge. Right. Um, you know, Kirill Papko, who like Stern is a uh, immigrant from Argentina uh, and came to the U.S. as a already as a promising young doctor and cancer researcher and did uh, his residency and fellowship at Harvard. Um, Carol is, like a lot of people you meet as an adult, somebody with whom uh, Stern has always enjoyed spending time, but he's not really sure he knows Carol at his core. Um, what he does know is that he is enormously indebted to Kirill Pafko because uh, without him, he would not be alive. And um, Stern, ironically, excuse me, because uh, G. Livia, this cancer medication, is at the center of the story in the last trial. Stern is probably the first human being who ever got it. Uh, and he was you know, on, on his way to, uh, you know, a final journey when uh, he got this medication and his life was completely restored. Uh, and when Kirill 
who's now been accused of securing approval of G. Livia um, by lying about it, by not telling the government that, yes, it helps a lot of people, but it also hurts quite a few uh, who develop acute allergic reactions and die in a very short period of time. Um, when Carol comes to Stern, Stern really feels that he can't say no. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, Carol has given him this time and he's asking Stern now as a professional to return the favor. Um, it, he's not really sure he's up to it any longer. And there are moments in the last trial where we can see that his second thoughts about it are well-founded. Yeah, I mean, his daughter is seeing that Carol is a complete manipulator. She's right. saying, I don't want you to do this. And he's in that really unique position because he feels like he owes him. But at the same time, I think as story goes on, he's starting to understand this guy is completely manipulating me. He's completely playing a game, but I'm in the game now and I still want to win. Right. So no matter what he's doing, I still want to come out. And it just shows where his head is moving around the whole time you're reading the book because it's right. like, wait a second, who is this guy? You know? Well, you know, as Stern thinks at one point, uh, if you want to improve your opinion of somebody you know, uh, you would not choose to be his criminal defense lawyer mm -hmm. because rarely, uh, if ever, is your opinion of somebody, and it, and it has happened. I mean, I had clients who I really came away admiring, uh, but that's a rarer experience. Usually, uh, they're not fully candid. Uh, they're, um, you know, they're self-justifying, they're blame shifting, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a very complex, uh, relationship. So Stern goes into this understanding all of that, uh, but there are still whole continents in Carol's character that, uh, were unknown to Stern when he started out, uh, and, uh, it's, it's a slow revelation, and Stern is always, consciously or not, measuring his life against Carol's. Here's Carol, he's won the Nobel Prize in medicine. Whether he lied or not to get this drug on the market, uh, you know, he's certainly <clears throat> associated with uh, some of the great discoveries in cancer research. Uh, and how does that stack up against the life of Sandy Stern? who's been prominent and certainly made a difference in many individuals' lives, but whom, as Stern concedes, near the end is, you know, is, is going to be long forgotten by time uh, when, who knows, you know, Carol may be well remembered. Yeah. And you're sort of, I think he's at the point in his life where he's measuring his life as he's exiting this career that's meant so much to him. And he's measuring it up against this other guy. And then this other guy starts to unravel a lot. And we're going to talk about that a lot more too, because there were so many different things that unravel along the way that made the story so interesting. Um, the one thing, this case includes a, a malpractice case about cancer, a drug coming to market. So tell us about your research on that, because I learned so much about the different steps that happen along the way. I mean, you hear a drug is out there and you hear a drug's expensive and everybody complains, but you sort of don't hear about what happened on the background. Right. Well, um, one of the things that happens when there is a criminal case, uh, particularly when a successful company is involved, is it, it ends up as a lawyer's a legal dog pile. Uh, and, um, you know, there's one group of plaintiffs, lawyers who want to represent the individuals, the families, uh, whose, uh, loved ones' lives were cut short, uh, by taking G. Livia without knowing that it had these lethal side effects. Then there's the securities class, uh, action lawyers who want to say that the value of the stock has been depressed as indeed, of course, it is when it turns out that there are these critical facts about G. Livia that weren't disclosed. Um, so, uh, you know, all of these many civil cases are operating in the background, and, uh, and the fate of those cases, to some extent, uh, is dependent on what happens in Kirill's trial. 
because if he's found guilty of doing what the government says, which is hiding the facts about G. Livia, the civil cases are going to become slam dunks. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of manipulation with the civil cases and um, they become an important backdrop um, to what is going on in the criminal case. Yeah, and, and how all well the lies are getting exposed. It's everything is on the backside of what's happening. But it's interesting because Sandy's still taking the medication, but he's getting it from India in a brown envelope. It's right. not coming from here. Does that happen a lot when a drug is pulled? Do people try to just seek it out other places? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Um, the, the problem um, is that uh, the purity of the manufacturing can often be in doubt. And uh, as it happens, Kirill has steered Stern toward the right factory uh, where uh, the actual medication is still being produced. Generally speaking, um, the US and the European regulators tend to move in lockstep, um, but not always. And, um, you know, sometimes it's the case that a drug is pushed off the market in the U.S., but you can still get it uh, in um, in Europe or certainly India. I remember when Vioxx was taken off the market, and uh, I've had a bad back for decades now. And uh, I went to one of my doctor friends and I said, "Damn it, I still want my dot Vioxx," mm -hmm. and he did. I mean, this is this is where I was stealing from life. He pointed me to an Indian supplier mm -hmm. where I could still get Viox and I got it for a long time. Now, um, federal, former federal prosecutor or not, didn't, I didn't really think about the fact that I was violating the law in doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. and I was, uh, but you know, I got my Viox the same way Sandy gets his G Livia and, you know, in a brown carton, so. Brown carton is shipped into the country. Here we go. How about the research you did into the accusations of insider trading and all that manipulation? Was there a lot of research or was that something you'd already touched on in your career and, or other places? Yeah, the, the insider trading um, is something, you know, when you do a white collar practice in a big uh, corporate law firm, as I have since 1986, uh, Insider trading is something you, you bump up against uh, with, with considerable regularity. So uh, I didn't really need to brush up too much on the law in that area. And I knew, uh, I knew what all the defenses were. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, as you can tell from what's in the last trial, um, it, this has been a very aggravating area of the law to me. It's been very good for my clients. But since I also do a lot of pro bono work, I certainly have, um, you know, I've been very much aware of the disparity in the law. So that if, if, if somebody is, steals a treasury check, which is to say usually, you know, a welfare or a social security check, and they're found in possession of it, um, the law engages in an, a presumption that they knew what they have in their hand is recently stolen property. Um, and the, the burden of proof is shifted against them. If somebody trades on insider information, uh, which is, I can't, there is no difference between that and the treasury check analytically. Uh, oh, the government's got to prove, you know, there's it's one hurdle and then another hurdle. And you got to prove that uh, the, the tippy had a confidential a duty of, to the company and the person who's using the information expects to profit from it. Uh, and it's really an, in, a huge example of class prejudice mm -hmm. uh, at work in the law, both in the way the law is framed uh, and the way it operates. And it's due to the fact, as Stern acknowledges, that there are a lot of fancy pants lawyers like him who have you know, chipped away at this law over the years and exacted higher and higher thresholds for conviction. And uh, it, it's, um, as I said, I've been very grateful for that in the case of, uh, of some of my clients uh, who've gone unprosecuted. 
Um, but uh, it isn't right. It's mm -hmm. really not right. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know, frankly, that people spend a lot of time thinking about these disparities, and they should, because it, it can be pretty disappointing. It's a real slippery slope of what's going on. Did he really do this? It's not him. It's the kids or the grandkids or whatever. It's, well, the, then was he really doing, and who gave him the advice? And did they give him the right advice? You really go down in this little, like, maze of what's happening that you realize you can get yourself out of if you've got somebody glib that's going to help you. Right, right. So. Well, it, so it goes. And, uh, you know, and there's, um, yeah, a Stern ultimately ends up making a, very technical defense on those charges, um, basically saying that um, he thought uh, that he was getting information uh, that was um, not subject to any rules of confidentiality. Uh, and uh, it's, it's quite a contorted argument. Uh, and you know, he, he has that moment that all, all of us trial lawyers have where, um, you know, you can see the jury looking at you going, knock it off, you know, <laughs> let's just knock it off. <laughs> you know, that so, isn't true and so do we. The show's not working. The show is not working. We're not buying your line. It's like in a comedy routine and nobody's laughing. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. We Speaking like it so much, but cut it out. Yeah. Speaking of which, Nobel Prize winner has a cachet to it, that you just assume that the Nobel Prize winner has done everything under the best of circumstances, everything's been, and the honor should mean what it means. And here we come to realize that Harold's kind of been trading on that Nobel Prize moniker for a very long time. And Sandy has stood in awe of that for a long time. And then, I'm not gonna reveal, but he learned some things that it wasn't quite yes. what you yes. thought. And, and including the fact that um, it's just had a very um, damaging impact on the way Carol behaves because, you know, his, his wife says that ever since he won that Nobel Prize, he's unable to accept the fact that he's wrong about anything. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he's one of those guys who... Um, live to have the press clippings and now wants to believe that they're true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, from that view, it's how many people contort their own lives is what I was seeing is they, they, they make up something about themselves. They get that kind of power or whatever. And then from there it's, well, that's who I am. And it's a right. conjecture of who they are. It's not who right. they really are. Right. It's the self mythologizing. Um, I guess everybody must do it to some extent, but um, you know, there are remarkably famous examples of, of people uh, doing this. And in my own life, um, you know, my dad had a bunch of remarkable stories about his service during World War II. And uh, I set out with, uh, I guess, my seventh novel, Ordinary Heroes, um, to make use of those stories. And... Uh, <laughs> I thought I was going to make peace with my father by doing this. And I started doing the research and reading his letters. And I, I suddenly realized that many of the stories that he told were complete bunk. You know, he wasn't where he said he was. He didn't do the things he said he did. And the most mysterious thing, Carol, um, was that he had no need to do that. The stuff he had actually done was so inherently heroic. Um, you know, volunteering to, you know, serve at the front lines. And why did he think he had to improve mm -hmm. on the many things that, that he had done? Uh, I never, you know, our parents remain enigmas to us to the end. And that was just something I didn't understand. But this is where the self-glorifying part of Kirill uh, connects to my own experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I suppose being really honest that, you know, mm, finds its roots right. in my dad. So yeah, it's yeah. And it's, it, it, we see people, we see parents as heroes and then you start to unravel the pieces and you're like, wait, who was this? How did that story actually come together? Yeah. And what you're saying here right now is, but you were so great at all these other things, which kind of brings me to the courtroom is like theater. 
Okay, so we've got theater here. We've got the well-orchestrated lines that are polished in advance, the audience of the jury as well as the spectators and how they're going to be performing their own roles in the room, uh, the tension between the players and even the seating of, and the setting of what's going on. And did you feel that when you practiced? Because I just feel like, I guess in this um, particular book, the description of the uh, courtroom itself, it was majestic. The, the, it, the way the uh, judge was sitting, where she was, where all the players were, you did such a good job of describing that, that I thought I was watching like the theater of what the law actually is, or could be. Well, um, the relationship between the courtroom and the stage is not incidental. They have quite a bit in common. And, uh, you know, courtrooms are often gorgeous. And they are built to be, you know, temples to the law. And uh, no trial lawyer uh, is, is any good if she or he is not part ham. Uh, they, they, they've got to enjoy the performance aspect of being a trial lawyer. And, uh, you know, and there's, there is a lot of performing uh, for the benefit of the jury. Uh, you know, turning around and looking at the prosecutor in disbelief when, you know, he or she makes an objection that you knew damn well was going to come when you asked that question. But, you know, you want the jury to think that, um, you know, the prosecutor is trying to keep them from hearing something that they would be naturally curious about. Uh, so the theatrics of the trial uh, are very much, you know, part of Sandy's life and certainly very much part of the last trial. He liked parts where people would laugh, people would, or they'd acknowledge, or he'd be, you know, they, he was watching the jury and saying, oh, look, she's laughing. Oh, I didn't think she'd get that one. Oh, I right. really like that. It's just completely coming across. These sub rows of relationships between the trial lawyers and the jurors, of course, you're supposed to have no personal relationship with them because um, they're, um, they're supposed to be impartial arbiters of what's happening. But every trial lawyer worth his or her socks is trying very much to form a personal bond, uh, <laughs> hopefully with everybody in the jury box, and if not that, at least with, uh, with a number of them. And uh, I remember one case, I had a long trial, about a three month trial, and uh, I knew we were gonna win the case, when two of the jurors right before court started were motioning to me and they're going like this and I'm like what the hell and I look down and my tie my tie is twisted up oh, okay. and they want me to know that I should groom myself so that I look look the part and uh, I, it was uh, as I said it was a moment of relief yeah, it's a moment of relief. And you're, and you're also seeing that he was seeing the nods, he was seeing the laughs, just, you know, just little gestures that I'm relating to these people instead of they're just looking, you know, blank wall. You know, there's some, sec um, there's some records that actually flip the case. There's some things that end up happening, which we're not going to disclose. But it reminds me of how the paper trail and the digital trail these days that people can lay for themselves and not even realize is completely different from what happened years ago. And there's really less hiding now than ever before. So when you started writing 30 years ago, these things were not available. Do you find that it's, you know, you have to try some new tricks up your sleeves, some new, some new things, because how am I gonna make this one different? Because these things can be found out. Well, fortunately for me, um, I don't have to worry about how I'm gonna make it different because the law has been so impacted by mm -hmm technological change that there is always something different uh, to master and uh, every time I've had to deal with DNA in a case it's as if as if I hadn't done it before because the science has marched forward uh, so much and you know it, now electronic discovery uh, is part of every um, case involving any company uh, you know, what was emailed, what was archived, uh, and, you know, the electronic fingerprints that people basically leave behind. 
becomes uh, an important part of the evidence. Mm -hmm. And it also makes the trial of cases um, much more complex because the volume of documents uh, is huge. Uh, when I started out as a prosecutor, if you got, you know, if you found a note from somebody hidden in the files, you know, that was a cause of celebration. These days, people put the stupidest things in emails. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they know that it can come back and bite them in the behind. But in the rush of the day, they write this stuff down anyway. Uh, and, you know, then the prosecutor or the plaintiff's lawyer is sitting there with that document in their hand. And, you know, it, it, it's going to require uh, several backflips in order to be able to explain it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, how can you, un how can you undo what's really written out here? It's not just something that's a conjecture. You wrote it in an email. It's not like you just overheard it over the water cooler. Right. But you know, it, it, people don't think about when they read about these cases in the paper, how many million emails, um, you know, some young lawyer or even paralegal had to read through to find that, that smoking gun email. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, these days you've got uh, computers that will text search, you know, the entire trove of emails, but you gotta be uh, artful and imaginative and figure out what, what phrase are you looking for? Uh, what word? What's the magic word? Is it clinical trial uh, in the context of the, the crime in the last trial? Uh, certainly not going to be insider trading, um, but you'd search for that. Um, so uh, it, it's just a brave new world and it changes every couple of years. It's like I would be probably searching for, may I do this? Can I do this? Is this allowed? Those would be all the phrases because those are the ones that are going to have the answer. You know, uh, I'm not sure about this. Those are the phrases that are going to get people in trouble. Uh, <laughs> anything that's, uh, any, is this okay? Is a, that, that'd be a good one to look for. Yeah, usually it's not. Usually it's not. You know, somewhere in the book it's noted that, and I was really into the, the legal aspects of this, I think it's one of the reasons I was reading so slowly, that 70% of acquittals come when the defendant testifies, which I found very interesting. I take it you've got personal experience with this, and this is something that's known, is if they're on the stand, that could really sway what happens. You know, um, defense lawyers have um, different perspectives on this because some will say to you, well, yes, that's true. 70% of acquittals uh, take place when the defendant testifies, but you can't really make this decision without knowing how many cases where the defendant testifies result in convictions. And uh, we've all seen uh, cases where the defendant seems to have a pretty good chance until he gets on the witness stand and gets caught in one lie after another. And uh, it really comes down to what Stern thinks to himself, which is if the defendant seems like a nice person and is telling a story that's halfway credible, then maybe the jury um, will find that to create a reasonable doubt. Uh, but most of the time, people are charged with a crime for a reason, uh, and you get on the witness stand and a lot of other misbehavior comes out. Um, you know, Stern is richly aware of the fact that um, Carol Pafko's wife has been sitting in the uh, first row throughout the trial, and uh, if he were ever to testify, there would be a lot of very sordid facts uh, about the way Carol has treated his marriage uh, that would emerge. So Carol wants to testify and Stern uh, is, you know, going to do anything uh, short of kidnapping his client to keep that from happening. And you're also realizing with her in the first row, the jury's just not watching him. They're watching her reaction as well because they don't have just one focal. It's like they're looking across the room. And I found that he was seeing the big picture where Carol was seeing himself on stage. 
right. and I can do the same thing I did with everybody else. But he's saying, you're not going to get away with it. You know, it's just not going to work. Right, right. Trump also says at one point that pleading guilty is even worse than being convicted by a jury. And if you heard that from people in the past of like, I'd much rather have the jury say. Absolutely. I mean, they, I mean, you'll, you see, um, especially public figures um, who can imagine life after prison, uh, who want to be able to always say it was a bum rap. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the prosecutors made up a bunch of crap and the jury believed it, you know, but I was innocent. I was always innocent. If you stand up and plead guilty, if you're anybody but Michael Flynn, um, you know, you're, ne you're never going to be able to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, even Michael Flynn is going to discover that there are uh, some pretty serious consequences to having acknowledged lying. Um, there are a lot of things he's not going to be able to do in his life as a result of that. It's, it's, it, it's all just become so much more complex. But likewise, the jury's told that not guilty does not mean innocent. It just means that the case wasn't proven the best way. It wasn't proven you know, within the extent of the law. The prosecutor did not do their job. And do you feel that educating readers like this, because I think a lot of people hear guilty or not guilty, and they're not thinking that the case has to be proven. It's not just the person's behavior. That's what the trial is about. It's not whether they did it or not. It's whether it can be proven that they did it. Well, that's the lawyer's frame of reference always. You know, people will always ask criminal defense lawyers, how can you stand to represent those people? Um, and the answer, which I, I give in all sincerity, which is, look, it is the government's job to prove this person guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, not just come in with some evidence, but a lot of evidence. So that a reasonable person looking at this is not gonna have much doubt about what actually happened. Uh, and, you know, Stern in the last trial, when he gets to his closing argument, has a really interesting formulation for this based on something that's happened earlier with his granddaughter. And he says, you know, there's just a lot of times in life where we say, I don't really know for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what, that's what not guilty means. I just don't really know for sure. Uh, and, uh, and, he, and he talks about how hard it is for people to admit that, um, that they don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and yet, if you can get a jury to say, I don't know for sure, the defendant deserves to walk out of the courtroom. Mm -hmm. it, has, it hasn't been proven. The case hasn't been proven. I mean, and we can think of so many even famous cases where how could she leave? How could she walk away from that case? There was the case of the mother in Florida that time. People were like, but everything said that this was going to happen. And then it didn't. It just didn't happen that way. You know, I feel for both Sandy and his daughter, Marta, closing down the practice with this case gives us a huge sense of gravitas. Everything that they're doing, this is the last final argument. This is the last of this that I'm going to be doing. But it's been... The law has been different for them, you know, throughout their careers. She's never loved it like Sandy. And for him, I feel like each oh. step towards the end is kind of wistful. For her, it's not. Did you feel the same as you were writing it as writing from their two different points of view about this? Because she's kind of relieved. It's like, woof, we're going to be walking away now. Well, I mean, I, obviously, I'm a little more on Sandy's side than on Marta's. Um, you know, I, I'm still doing it, although not full time by any means. Uh, and the point in my life has long passed where I need to practice law. Uh, I do it because I have many of the feelings about the law that, that Stern does, uh, that it's an eternal puzzle uh, and that the questions it asks are really often very difficult ones to which there are no good answers. We're all wondering these days about clinical trials. Mm -hmm. in the context of, you know, what I call the damn-demic. And um, you know, the question uh, really is, can we put a drug on the market uh, without knowing uh, how grave the risks are mm -hmm. to the people who won't be helped by it? Uh, and uh, that fascinates me, and it fascinates Stern. Marta, on the other hand, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, loves her father more than she loves the law. 
and it's been very fulfilling for her, uh, you know, to share this life with him. Uh, and she's a very good lawyer, but she's reached the point where uh, she's done it, uh, and you know, she's not going to spend her final vital years, especially before her kids start having kids, um, you know, working 20 hours a day. And uh, so she stuns her father early in the novel by telling him that she is going to retire. And, uh, you know, Stern is utterly flabbergasted. He never, he never saw that coming. And that was one of those moments where I didn't see it coming either. Mm -hmm. I just st started writing and all of a sudden she's saying, I'm going to retire. And I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> what the hell is going to happen to the law firm? <laughs> But it was interesting because one of the reasons she wants to is she wants to travel before her children have children because then she's going to want to be around. And I thought that was a really good line because a lot of people say, especially with what's going on now, you don't want to be too far from your children because you want to be able to see them even if waving from the car or whatever. And I think that when she said that, I was like, that is really true because people want to be there when their kids are growing up. You're not going to want to do that three month trip to Europe or whatever because you want to be around for the grandkids. Right. I mean, I am sitting here in Florida. Um, and to say that, um, my view of Florida was just like Sandy Stearns before I got here. Um, my, mine was probably more damning than his. And Stern describes Florida as a penal colony for America's elderly. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, when Adrian, my wife, she had a big corporate job and, uh, she left it. And we said, okay, well, well, let's go somewhere and get away from the winter in, in, in Chicago. Well, I'd always thought I'm going to the desert or Northern California. Uh, and I began looking at airline schedules and my elder, uh, my eldest child, my older daughter was pregnant with her third kid. And uh, I wanted to be there when that little boy was born. Uh, there was, with two other kids, there was going to be a lot to do. An extra pair of hands was going to be very valuable. Uh, and we literally are here in Florida because of our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's why we're here. Uh, and that's not an unusual decision. Uh, you know, and I frankly um, will, will never fully recover from the fact that I was unable to talk my son and his family uh, out of, uh, not, they, they, they decided not to leave Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I thought, oh, this is not a good decision. And uh, I think maybe they would agree with me today. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's been a hard go in New York City uh, for millions and millions of people. Yeah, and I think that when people were there, they were like, oh, I'll just stay. It's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be this. And the way people are being able to cope with the pandemic, we live in Western Jersey and the office is in New York, is completely different. I mean, I went into the office a couple of weeks ago and it was me and six people who clearly were homeless on the, city, on the streets, walking two blocks between my office. And, you know, it was a very odd experience. It oh, I'll bet. Just, it's just, I felt like, you know, is this an episode of The Walking Dead, to be perfectly honest? Because yeah, it was like, this sure. is just really strange. And it's not the city that you knew. And people's comfort level and their um, panic level is completely different. My son, my younger son lives only 20 minutes away, but he still comes over with, you know, social distance with the mask. And yesterday he said to me, mom, do you want to zoom and talk at some point? I never even thought about doing that with you. And I said, we've been texting for seven weeks. Do we really never think about that? You know, but it's all these. And I think that, look, we can at least connect because there is the internet. It would have been a lot more lonely. Oh without it. Can you I imagine mean, if this was 30 years ago? And we were cut off from everybody mm -hmm. um, so much more completely than we have been. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we've done a lot of Zoom dinners and mm -hmm. I, I found them shockingly satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, Adrian's funny. She says, oh, let, let this, let's, but let's always do this because that way I don't have to clean up the house. And <laughs> just right here, <laughs> you're just editing like what's here in the house. That's exactly right. it. That's exactly it. You know, it's actually, um, there are a few scenes in Naples in the book when, in, yes, definitely Sandy does not like going down there, but you reference a strobing green light at sunset. Have yeah. you seen that? 
Yeah, we've seen the we've we've seen the so-called green flash twice, and uh, I don't even know what accounts for it. It's something about it. It's you know when you see the sun set, it's actually already gone. Mm -hmm. So the light is being bent over the horizon, and there's something about that reflection off the water um, that occasionally produces this you know s sudden greenish. Um, eruption of light. Um, doesn't happen very often. And I don't even know exactly what it, in our experience, they've been on exceptionally clear at nights that, mm -hmm. that this has happened, but it is, it is remarkable. And there was also one time, um, I think it was late last year where the sun disappeared in a greenish fog, this almost like a green mist rose, uh, as the sun disappeared. So, um, but watching sunset is, as uh, as one of the characters in the last trial puts it, it's a local form of worship mm -hmm. in Naples. And uh, you know, uh, candidly, that's where we're going to go tonight. We'll go down to down to the beach because they've been recently reopened here, uh, and uh, enjoy sunset. So. Yeah. Uh, I talked to Don Winslow a couple weeks ago and he was talking about doing the same thing on the West Coast when everybody goes sits on their surfboards and just watches the sun go down, like right. religion. It's just right. like a religion there. You know, you also write about Sandy visiting his sister and you have a few short paragraphs about that. There's really not that much. But in there, I learned so much about Sandy, his sister, the relationship. It's this real tight writing. And I just want you to know I came away from that where it was purposely brief, but it worked. And it completely gave me another look into him and his life. So bravo to you on that one too. Yeah, well, I mean, Sandy's sister is a much larger figure in the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't forget about Sylvia. Um, and uh, in, in part because, as was the case in the burden of proof, they have a very special intimacy and uh, do in large part to the, you know, the, their early life experiences where the Stearns uh, came to the U.S. as illegal immigrants um, and uh, before they were referred to as undocumented. Um, and uh, they shared that experience. Their mother passed away early uh, and they really, they clung to each other in this new country. And uh, both have done exceptionally well, but uh, they have one of those relationships where they can talk to each other only for 30 seconds a day, but they just want to hear one another breathe. Um, and uh, so... It was clear he couldn't go to Florida and not see her. No. It's clear that he had to go there. That you was... wouldn't think about it because they take real pleasure in each other's company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even if they just sit out on you know her back porch and do nothing, um, there's, a, there's a peace between them. Yeah. So the other night I was reading and I was on page 300 and I looked and said there were 150 more and I was kind of satisfied at 300. I was, this is really looking good. And then the last 150 I finished at 2 a.m. And uh, sat there was up till 3 a.m. thinking about them and all the twists that had taken place along the way. Were those twists um, engineered or outlined in advance or did you just let the story take you as time went on? Because it was like, whoa, where are we going now? Um, usually, um, when I'm in the early phases, I just um, kind of go with the flow. But uh, I had that vision pretty early on of, um, you know, that, that, that there would be a sort of false sense of suspense about what's going to happen in the trial. It's not false, it's genuine suspense. But once that question is answered, um, you still don't know, just as Stern says, you very often you walk out of a courtroom and don't know who really committed the crime. So that question remains. And uh, the, the unraveling of, uh, of what really happened is where the last 150 pages mm -hmm. of the last trial um, take place. And, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I like sort of working against form and, uh, you know, having the reader 
think is they've got half the book left, you know, wow, this trial is going to take a lot longer than it seems like it will. Uh, must be that PAFCO testifies and this cross-examination takes 100 pages. And then, oops, wait a minute, the trial is over. Um, and then, but wait a minute, I don't know anything. Uh, exactly. Um, it's it's I, whatever I, you thought is not really happening here. Right. So I always have fun with that. Well, it totally had me up till 2 a.m. and then 3 a.m. thinking about it. So you did your job. Totally worked. Thank you. You've written four nonfiction books. Did researching the nonfiction influence any of your fiction writing? Like what you did on any of those books? Um, well, um, you know, I wrote 1L um, by accident. Uh, I decided to go to law mm -hmm. school and give up an academic career and ended up with this contract to write a book, just one of the most um, deliciously ironic things that could happen in a life. Um, Cause I'd always, I thought when I decided to go to law school, it's gonna be a real struggle to write. And uh, literally a month and a half later, I was sitting there with a contract to write a book. Um, so uh, that was not, heavily research intensive. The other nonfiction book I've written is Ultimate Punishment, which was about the death penalty. And um, again, um, I did some research to write that book, but the reality is that um, I had been on the Capital Punishment Commission in Illinois, 12 people who studied the way the capital punishment system was being uh, implemented in the state. And uh, I'd already spent two years really studying what was happening. So I, I would say being honest that I've done more hard nosed research for my novels mm -hmm. uh, than, I, than I did for either of those books. And there was you know, considerable research nonetheless, but um, I'd had a lot of it handed to me in the course of uh, living the experiences that are also part of those books. Mm -hmm. So I take it that the title, The Last Trial, was always the title of the book? It was always the title of the book. There's like no other title that would have worked on this book. But what I did really like is, let me see if I can pull this up for the readers, is throughout, well, besides prologue, you have all little different chapter heads, and you've mm -hmm. got the timeline going. And right. I always found that I was looking at those titles. This one's, you know, The Witnesses. Right. And Trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, come together. Were those something you went back and did later on, or you, were you doing those as you wrote, or did they? Once the book had its structure, this is the witnesses. This is, you know, whatever we're going to be calling the section, because it's really like the, the flow of a trial. Um, I wanted to organize the book uh, along the lines of the trial, and you know, if you look at the federal rules of criminal procedure. Um, they're structured just that way with the different mm -hmm. stages of the, of the criminal process. And I had that in mind. Of course, eventually I realized, given what we've uh, already talked about, that it, it couldn't all be bound by the trial because a third of the book was going to take place after the trial. So, um, but, I, I, that's where those chapter headings came from. Yeah, and it's funny because I was going through all your other books and the others had dates or they had a character name or whatever, but, but this is the first time in the book run from what I was seeing. And they really work because I find that I get to the header of the chapter, happened with Emma Straub's book last week also. And you see the header of her chapter and you're like, wait a second, how's that gonna relate? And it's, I found it was um, clever. It was clever to be doing as well. And it was something for the reader to be thinking a little bit more as you got there. It was this moment to pause, read that, and then keep reading into the yeah. chapter. And it, I mean, it's an opportunity. It's a form of signaling between the author and the reader. Um, mm -hmm. And it's another little opportunity to take the reader by the hand and give them some kind of guidance. Yeah, where we're going next. So your latest screen project is a new adaptation of Presumed Innocent. Did I see that? Is that true that that's going on? You know, it's, it, it, yes, it's definitely true. Um, and, um, but I've been asked not to talk about it um, yeah. at this stage beyond acknowledging that it is happening. Um, it's, it's, you know, sometimes 
an idea is right. And in the last um, four or five months, three different producers and or writers have come to me all with the same idea. You know, Presumed Innocent would really be great as a streaming series. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, interesting. So mm -hmm. it must be that it's a good time for it to happen. Yeah, I think that people are looking for good material. I think that on streaming, it's been such a wonderful time for authors because they've written works that can not just be a feature film at this point, it can be a streaming series, can be seen by a lot more people. Actually, with what's going on with the pandemic and so much not being created for fall television and the movies that aren't ready, I have been telling people in publishing that this is a moment for books. This is a huge moment because people can read. You've seen a lot that's already on Netflix. You've seen a lot of what's going on and things are not in production. So we have an opportunity now through the summer, probably into the early fall. Oh, at least, people, at least, Carol. At least, yeah. So because, we have this opportunity you know. of the show that you liked, here's a book, like these are the books, these are the stories from these people, this is what's going on. And I just think it's a golden opportunity for books that we need to seize. It is, it, it is. The only problem is, of course, that so many of the retail outlets, mm -hmm. uh, especially the independent stores that are so important to the, the lifeblood of America's literary community, um, they haven't been able to be open. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, that, that's, that is the problem. I'm sure that book sales in general um, are doing fine, but they're being driven through, um, you know, the big corporate uh, providers. Uh, Absolutely. And, and in the stores, more of that. I've been watching stores like reopening even from afar. They're like, you know, 10 people in the store, one person in the store, whatever. But still, what I feel is that this fall, there will be book product where there will not be new television and new yes. movie product, even when the stores reopen. Books are already being jacketed. They're already being printed. They're already edited because of the way we work in advance. I mean, some stuff for next spring, you know, winter is even being readied at this point. And the movie is behind it because there's so many other pieces that have to take place. It's, a, it's not a business that works well remotely the way book writing does. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought for a second about what you're saying, um, especially when the well runs dry, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what's already in the can uh, at, at Netflix or Amazon or, uh, you know, AMC, where, whatever it is. Uh, you're right. Um, everything stopped production in March. Mm -hmm. um, the insurers have told the networks and studios that they're not insuring them if mm -hmm. if they go back into production right now so uh, they're at a standstill and you're right eventually everybody will have seen everything mm -hmm. netflix back of tricks uh and you're right books will become even more appealing yeah. I just think it's gonna be a real moment. Um, our reviewer, Ray Palin, who's reviewing your book on Friday, did wanna know how you felt, this is a personal question, about the casting of Raul Julia as Sandy in the film version of Presumed Innocent. Did you picture him in that role? So that's a question from our reviewer. Well, that's a good question. And uh, I remember when I met the late Raul on the, on the set of Presumed Innocent, he said, I know I am not your Sandy Stern. And, um, you know, Sandy Stern should only be so lucky as to look like Raul Julia. Uh, he, he, he does not. And indeed, it's part of the uh, part of his glory that he's such an unassuming looking person who kind of lights up like there's a beacon inside of him. Uh, and, you know, that that was lost because, you know, Julia was uh, a really impressive physical presence, uh, but he was so good, mm -hmm. so damn good, uh, and uh, just worked worked like a Trojan um, every night rehearsing to get the courtroom cadences down uh, and to make sure that, you know, he didn't stumble over the unfamiliar, you know, language of, of, of lawyers. Um, so I, you know, I didn't, I did not object at all because Stern is written as Hispanic. Um, you know, even 30 years ago, um, 
there was a feeling, certainly Alan Pakula, who directed Presumed Innocent, felt that I am not going to take a part written for someone of, you know, Latinx heritage uh, and give it to somebody who doesn't share that heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there are not a lot of prominent roles uh, for Latinos anyway. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll be damned if I'm going to turn around and have somebody pretend uh, to come from that background. And I was fully behind that. I thought that was 100% correct. You know, last week I was watching about um, the documentary about Natalie Wood on HBO, and they were talking about how she never would have been cast in West Side Story today. She never would have been able to right. have that role because it was the time. It was a completely different time and what could have happened. It's really interesting. So it's been three years since Testimony. Your novels usually are three to four years apart, and we actually do like that because I don't feel like, I feel like you... Your books come out when they're ready to come out, as opposed to some people that are just churning out a book a year. And, you know, this is what I need to do. So have you started the next one? Have you started? I have. I have. I'm started. And, uh, you know, I've already uh, admitted that uh, I'm trying to write about Stern's granddaughter, Pinky, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, by the end of the last trial has sort of earned her spurs as an investigator. Um, so she's in that role. Um, in, uh, in, in the next book. The challenge, of course, is that Pinky will be then about 33 years old. I am not 33 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, neither I nor my kids or even their close friends uh, have, are, are, are people like Pinky. So I got to feel my way to, into her world. Mm -hmm. and uh, find her voice. Um, and, you know, there are, I've, I've already written a couple of passages that um, I think that's it. That's exactly right. That's what she's, that's what she's going to sound like. Uh, and of course, she's an inveterate wise guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, always with her own point of view. And by the way, deeply, deeply, um, self-conscious about her strangeness. Mm -hmm. She knows that, you know, she's often, um, she's, she's often the only person in the room who doesn't get it. Um, so that's, that's another part of her character and it's something else that um, I'm looking forward to writing even more about. Yeah, I, I liked, you know, there were sprinkles throughout where I sat there and go, hmm, she's a really strong character. That would really work. And I also found that she did earn her stripes on this one. Besides, you know, because she comes up with so many of the great ideas, that heroic scene at the beginning. She's right. the one that goes and calls 911. I mean, you just love it because everybody else is acting and she's like, this is what you need to do. And that was such a huge clue to me of her as personality. That when I look back later on, I'm like, wait, what did she do? She did the smart thing. And there were so many times where you sit there and it goes, wait, I just figured this is what you should do. And it was more instinctual to her. And I think that that's the one thing I saw with her. She was acting on pure gut instinct where everybody else was overthinking. She was just doing what she thought she should do. Right. Of course, that, that does lead her um, astray uh, often. Her boss in the new novel says to her at one point, you know, I would really like to be inside your head because... There's a lot of stuff that happens there that has nothing to do with what goes on in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, her instincts are, um, are, are often accurate, but she probably is a little too convinced that she's always right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, the readers of The Last Trial seem to be charmed by Pinky and certainly the author was so yeah, yeah no, I could tell I could tell it and it was um even when she's doing the craziest of things like she's going out at night in the zany outfit and he doesn't want to know what she's really going to do <laughs> there's something completely charming about her that she's doing that and she's making him crazy so so I have one last question is since you're in Florida I know you play golf how's your game been has your game been good this winter you know um it's gotten better in the last month, but it was really bad for a long time. And I came down to Florida with the lowest handicap of my life mm. uh, and 
it just ballooned after after the first of the year. So um, as I said, in the last in the last month, I've shot better rounds. But you know, golf is a great game for a writer because uh, you know you're always looking for something to do in the afternoon. <laughs> Stop writing. Wait, I can go out on the golf course. My husband is lamenting here right now because they're allowed back on the golf course, but they can only play with two people. And because they can only play with two people 16 minutes apart, he can't go out with the people that he wants to be playing golf with. And I'm laughing because I said, out of the pandemic, the worst thing that's happening to you right now, like yeah. just explain this to me. Is yeah. You can't play golf with four guys. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, but you know, the, um, the relationships that people make, um, you know, in my era, of course, it was mostly men. Now it's both men and women. Mm -hmm. that they make through sports um, are really uh, important. And of mm -hmm. course, um, because guys are not as good at being intimate with one another, uh, you learn a lot about somebody watching them play a game. You know? Who does cheat? who does go into the woods and come back with the ball. And you're like, really? I don't think it went that way. Right. right we right. used to rent a house on the Outer Banks and we would be on the golf course. And I, I didn't want to rent it in the summer. We always did that when the winter and the spring and you'd hear the ball go plunk because we were right on the 18th hole and somebody come wandering into the backyard. And I said, 10 bucks, I'll tell you where it is. Yeah. <laughs> because I know exactly where it is. Yeah. And I said, it's in that shrub over there. But if you want to grab the one over there, the other guy didn't get it. And it used to be, you know, but a lot of people also said that it's very easy to social distance in golf because they're always six feet away from where they're supposed to be. <laughs> right. No problem right. At all. <laughs> right. The one problem in golf in all seriousness, and I've spent a, a lot of time thinking about this because I, I don't want to indulge myself too much. Everybody shows up at the hole and remembering to keep your distance there um, is is what's really important. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, you know, okay, where's our line draw of like, you know, what we're going to do here because we're all showing up to celebrate. And we'll show up at the 19th hole too. Right, The 19th yeah. hole is the one where you yeah. really gotta There's be careful. There's no 19th hole in most places, so. Yeah, no 19th hole. Scott, it's always a pleasure. It's great sure, to see thank you. I've seen you since Miami years ago, Miami Book Fair years ago. So it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I loved it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the good conversation and for reading the book so carefully. Oh, my Start pleasure. The author. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us today.